for your word. It is powerful. It is effective. Um, your word, Lord, caused this whole world to come into being. You spoke and there was light. Lord, your word is powerful. John 1 talks about the word the word being Jesus was in the beginning and part of creation. So God, we pray that your powerful word would work in our hearts to do exactly what we need it to do, to cut deeply, to bring comfort, to bring encouragement, to bring insight, and to bring revival to our spirits. Psalm 19 talks about um, how your word brings that revival. So would you do that in our hearts? Breathe. In a fresh way, oh Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So the word Genesis means beginning and Exodus means exit. So that's pretty easy to remember. But they, it's kind of, it just flows into one big, wonderful story. So I encourage you to, uh, you know, to know the beginning of the book. That's really important to uh, if you, you know, it's like jumping into a, into a novel, but you start halfway through or towards the end. You're not really getting the whole context. You might catch it some, but it's so important that we understand the beginning of everything because the messages that we'll get from others are that from our society, from, from the enemy is that, uh, that God has nothing to do with that and that there is only chaos and uh, there's just human evolution is how all things came to be and there is no God. So we need to know that, that God is and that he has a story that we are still a part of. And so it's really important to understand the beginning of this story so that we'll understand the sections that follow. So today I just want to just do a quick, I mean, how do you do a quick overview of Genesis? Uh, but here's some key people that, that appear throughout the story and that will lead us into the book of Exodus and the significance of it. But there's a lesson that'll, that starts with all these people that are listed on the screen and that carries over into the life of Moses. <clears throat> and I believe you will learn a lot and just ask God, is there something that he wants you to take away from today that will be good for your heart? And he has a way of being able to personalize those things. So um, what we want to do, so Adam and Eve, the first people, they were real people, okay? That's what we believe because we believe that the Bible is true, that it wasn't just a fairy tale or a myth that was infused with meaning, but the facts are there that this is how God did it. And so we all have to come to grips with that and the whole creation story <clears throat> this past summer, we were able to travel to the Creation Museum in Kentucky and the Ark Encounter, where there's a life-size like rebuild of the Ark. It's massive. But uh, there's a lot of wonderful stuff there um, that is that is scientific. And if you think about the who the first scientists were, they were people who believed that God had created an orderly system so that when they studied it, they wouldn't just come up with random conclusions, but they could actually study the facts that happened, look at things, observe them, and then come to conclusions because God is a consistent God who made things in a certain way. And so science and the Bible are not really in contradiction. So be encouraged by that, explore those things <clears throat> and know that God's word is true. And that real science comes out of the knowledge that God is an orderly God and he created it in a way that is consistent, that we can even study it and discover. And that's what those first scientists were, was people who believed that God did this and they could discover more about God in uh, the study of the natural world. <clears throat> so we have Adam and Eve who, uh, I mean, we could... We'll talk a long time there, but it all goes back to Adam and Eve. Our, the, we call it the fall into sin, their choice to sin, to go against God, to doubt God. We know that Satan had a role in that, to tempt them, to feed them lies. And so 
um, you're gonna we're gonna find that theme in Exodus when uh, when the evil Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, um, is doing terrible things. It's usually based on a lie, <clears throat> and when he gets the whole country to kill babies, it's based on a lie. So the power of the lie was seen in the life of Adam and Eve, and they, the choice that they made had uh, eternal ramifications, not just for them, but also for us, the Bible says. It's just like our DNA and the things that we have inherited, we too have inherited a sin nature. And it doesn't take you long hanging around with little kids to understand that we don't have to teach them to be bad. We, we try to teach them to be good. We try to correct their behavior. Uh, and that comes because we are sinful people. Okay, And that's why from the very beginning, then, God had a plan to save us. And those are that those that plan is seen in these people on the screen. It's seen in Noah, and these are like used as examples for us of faith, of God's judgment, of God responding to people, of God choosing imperfect people to work through. So we have that with Noah, with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob and Joseph, all of them flawed people carrying on from Adam and Eve that sinful nature. And uh, <clears throat> but God works in their lives. So if you think of um, if you think of Noah, <clears throat> God chose one man out of the population of the world at that time. He chose one man, one family, one boat to save the human race from being totally wiped out. It was a disaster beyond all belief. The flood, and it, the uh, when we go when you went when we went to the creation museum and the ark, and um, we talk they talk about it as a fact and how it is a was a real and a worldwide and a devastating event that explains a lot of you know the the stratification of the earth. It explains a lot about fossils and all those things that it doesn't have to take millions of years to do these things. But fossils can be created in, you know, in a very short amount of time. And they, if you're familiar with Mount St. Helens, when, when uh, volcano kind of the mountain explodes and all kinds of things happen, the stratification of Earth, things going, you know, trees going through all the different layers as the sediment and things filtered out, and then like being like frozen in time. So just very fascinating things, again, that these are facts that are not just myths, but we can believe them. So this is a disaster beyond all belief, yet God chose Noah and his family, one person who loved God and gave him an impossible plan, building a boat, a floating zoo, in a sense, gave him 120 years, possibly, and three sons to help him. And God preserved human beings so that we are here today because of the humble obedience of one person. Also think about Abraham. God decided he wanted to have one whole nation that would live and act differently than all the rest. These people would demonstrate to the whole world what it was like to know the one true God. It would be through this very special group of people that he would work throughout all of future history. So he chooses one couple, who doesn't have any children and can't have any children and says that they will become a mighty nation. Notice that how God does these amazing things, but he chooses these insignificant people in very impossible kinds of situation. Isaac. Isaac is the son that was born like miraculously to Abraham and Sarah. So Isaac was the one that God says to Abraham, to Abraham that he will build this nation through this son. But there's only one problem. God says to sacrifice him. It seems impossible enough before. And yet God like makes it even more impossible. Abraham in faith says, okay, God, I trust you even when it doesn't make sense. I know that I can trust you and believe you. Jacob is another interesting case in point. He is, he's a deceiver. He's, he tricks his brother out of a birthright, out of his inheritance, 
And then he has to run away because his brother is going to kill him. And, and yet God, he encounters God in this process at the beginning of his journey, running away from his brother and also coming back, getting ready to reunite with his brother um, after this whole kind of marriage fiasco, right? Two wives, two concubines, um, and eventually 12 sons that become the 12 tribes of Israel. How God can sort these things out is amazing. And it, these things are so difficult, right? Because often, <clears throat> like with, with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, their lives are in danger. The very future of salvation history is in danger. And yet God can pull off these things, and God is good at that. One of Jacob's sons is named Joseph. Amazing story. It takes up like from chapter 35 to 50 of Genesis. So that's a story that uh, you can read and study and learn from forever. That the Joseph was you know, Joseph was a favorite of his dad Jacob, uh, which wasn't necessarily a healthy thing. His brothers hated him and ended up instead of killing him, they had another plan of selling him. He became a slave down in Egypt. And we have these ups and downs of life that just really reflect. If you ever feel like your life is kind of up and down, it's like, why can't it just be up? You know, why can't I stay on top of the wave or on top of the mountain? Joseph's life goes up and down. And we find that he ends up being lied about, false accusations. He's sent to prison. So even in his slavery, he says God was with him. He didn't give up on God. God was with him and gave him favor, even in the, the house where he served. And, but then he was, again, falsely accused by his boss's wife, who was trying to seduce him. He gets thrown. So after being a slave, he gets thrown into prison. And then even in prison, rather than giving in to bitterness and disappointment and despair, he decides he's just going to serve God faithfully in these little ways. And God honors that and somehow uses that as a way after years there that he is released from prison and he becomes the second in command to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Who would, I mean, that's just an impossible, totally impossible thing. And yet we have here one, one little brother who was picked on, who was almost killed, who was sold into slavery, who spent time in prison, and yet God elevated him so that he would save lives. <clears throat> Let me give you a something to think about here that stood out to me, and you'll see it in the life of Moses. It's this word. I'll, I'll put it on the screen in a little bit, but it says this. When God wants to show the world his power, he takes an impossible situation. He allows it to become even more impossible. And then he takes an insignificant person or people, and he does the miraculous. I'll have that on writing <clears throat> up there in a few minutes, but this seems to be a pattern, and I don't think God is done doing that with people like you. When God wants to show the world his power, his love, his message, he takes an impossible situation, he allows it sometimes to even become more impossible, which could be very discouraging. We're tempted to give up then. But then he takes an insignificant person or an insignificant people, and then he does something amazing. That is our hope, isn't it? That life is not just going to be one continual down, down, down. But out of that, our hope is that God will lift us up. God will do something. And he can even use us little people who are not famous and we're not so wonderful. All these people on the screen um, you know, think of the life of Jacob, man, he was, he was just, uh, he was a liar. He was deceiving and he was deceived <laughs> was, uh, by others. And man, how did God use these people? It's amazing, but it's good news for you and I, because God can use you. God can use me no matter how messed up we are when he gets us on track. So, <clears throat> Dan, could you do me a favor and just grab me that water bottle on that table? <laughs> so
So just a quick overview before we uh, before we dive into the book of Exodus. God's people are in slavery. So that's where we pick up the story. There's so Joseph was in close with, with Pharaoh, right? He was number two. He saved the country from the huge famine. He saved his family from the famine, and God reunited them at the end of the book of Genesis. There's this very cool, very dramatic reconciliation between Joseph and the brothers who sold him into slavery. And they were given a favored position in the country. And so God brought them from the land that he had promised them down south into Egypt to preserve their lives with the promise that someday you guys are going to go back because God had promised this land is going to be yours someday. And so they're down in Egypt. Their lives are saved. Things are going well. Okay. Kind of that one of those ups and downs that is the story of life, it seems. So things are going well for them. Years go by, though. The people, this whole country, this whole nation that God has established through the line of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, <clears throat> that there's 12 brothers become 12 tribes, and things are going well for them. But then um, a different king comes to power, doesn't even remember Joseph. So we're talking years and years of history here. They don't remember Joseph, and now they see God's people as a threat. So the people of Israel, which is the new name that God gave to Jacob. So if you ever wonder where Israel came from, it came from Jacob, from one guy, because he was the father of these 12 tribes, these 12 groups, clans of people. Okay, so <clears throat> they're there and they're growing in numbers. They're successful. They're becoming powerful. And that the king gets afraid of that. He says, man, if, if somebody goes to war against us and these people, these pe these Israelites, turn and, and favor the enemy, we're in deep trouble. We need to do something about this minority group within our country so that they aren't going to turn against us. And then becomes this whole thing where basically they're put into slavery, <clears throat> made to work. And uh, we'll talk about some of those very sad stories and how it's like the question come up. It's like, where is God? Where is God? And it came, it says over and over again that the people cried out to God and finally, God heard them, and he, as he chose, as he chooses Moses to be this super unlikely guy to lead this exit out of captivity in Egypt. So we have the famous burning bush time. So Moses was called the story of a, a, a bush that was on fire out in the wilderness while Moses is herding sheep. And the voice of God comes to him and calls him. And wow, what a call. <laughs> and Moses is like arguing with God. It's just like crazy. It's We're going to learn a lot from that. Moses has a brother named Aaron. And then we have, of course, the Pharaoh, the confrontation with the, the leader of this powerful country. Um, and we have what is called the Passover, where the blood of the lamb was put on the door to save them from the judgment of God. Anybody who had blood of the lamb over the door would be saved. If you didn't, the angel of death would come there and visit and kill the firstborn. And so that image is carried on throughout the history of Israel and then is carried into even the, the communion, the last supper that Jesus was celebrating the Passover with his disciples. And then we have the miraculous crossing of the Red Sea. We have the giving of the Ten Commandments. We have people being unfaithful with the golden calf and God's people complaining after God had done all these things. So that's just a brief picture of what's coming in Exodus. And maybe Scott, can you click on that left screen for me? <clears throat> Some very cool things that God does here. God reveals his name. I mean, in that call to Moses, he reveals his name, his attributes, meaning what is he really like? He reveals his redemption, his plan of redemption. How does, how does he redeem? How does he save? How does he rescue a people? Uh, the pictures within the Passover are just amazing. He gives the law, the Ten Commandments, and all kinds of other rules, including how he used to be worshipped and the construction of the tabernacle. 
So a lot of stuff there. And that next one. So here, here's that phrase written out. It's kind of a little cumbersome. It probably could be done a little bit better. Um, but here it is. When God wants to show the world his power, he takes an impossible situation, allows it to become even more impossible, then takes an insignificant person or people and does the miraculous. <clears throat> now, if you have a better way to say that, <laughs> let me know. Maybe a little shorter. I don't know. But it's. I want you to think about that and remember that because you're going to come into a situation that seems impossible. And you wonder, how could it get worse? Like, why is it getting worse instead of getting better? Don't give up at that point. Don't despair at that point. And you'll find out that Moses was really wrestling with that <clears throat> when he is obeying God's call and it's just not working. It's not working. And the people he's trying to rescue turn against him. And they don't even, they want him to leave and get out of here because things are actually getting worse. But it's not the end of the story yet. God is going to do something amazing. And it's that process. It's the waiting. It's the faith in God. And even as they, <clears throat> as they continue to follow God, they need to remember that lesson over and over again. When you get to the down point, you can't give up. You can't complain can't turn against God because he's about to do something and he's he's proven it before so don't doubt him now <clears throat> and I struggle with this right <laughs> like we all do it's like okay why is this getting worse why are all these things happening okay don't give up at that point because God is still there he's still with you and they and there is still great hope that things will turn around because God is a God of turnarounds the whole Exodus is a culmination of hundreds of years that people were being oppressed and treated horribly. But God was going to turn that thing around. It was not in their time frame. It was waiting way too long. <clears throat> Let me just close with sharing a, a little story of goes way back many years in, um, in Peru. And we went there for a short term, yeah, to be short term missionary just for a few months. And it turned out to be a little bit longer. When we got into the adoption process for our oldest son. And it was a, it was an interesting experience. It was, there was, we had fleas because we had a, somebody gave us a mattress that a dog had slept on. So we had fleas and then, um, then we had scabies. Um, we had not a serious car accident, but a very frustrating car accident. The first time I'd ever stayed in the hospital was in Peru because I ate some, I drank some apple juice at someone's house, found an ant floating in it and realized it was made with mixed with water rather than we had tried to be really careful about just drinking, you know, bottled water and things. So I got to explore what it was like to be in a hospital for the first time. Um, uh, Dan's first Christmas, he was in the hospital as, and I was in the hospital. There was a court strike when we needed papers to be signed. Um, when we needed a visa from the United States, there was roadblock after roadblock. They lost our, fing our fingerprints. The FBI lost our fingerprints somewhere like in Panama. Um, it just seemed to be <laughs> one problem after another. We were running out of money. God provided miraculously, but after being there two months beyond the time that we had raised <laughs> support, um, then I needed to come back to the United States to start working here in St. Paul. Um, so that left Deanne and Dan for a whole month by themselves in Peru. You know, God's people, the church was wonderful to them. Um, and when I was leaving, when I was leaving the country, like my Spanish wasn't so good. And instead of like just going right to the airplane, they took me into an office 
And my understanding was they wanted me to contribute to their boss's uh, retirement party. It's like, and so somehow my ignorance helped me out. <laughs> it's like they knew they weren't going to get any money out of me, and somehow somehow they let me go. Um, so there was all kinds of, and the the fear that our airline ticket was going to expire and we'd have to pay like nine hundred dollars more. And back in nineteen eighty five, that was a lot of money. It's a lot of money now. But through all kinds of different circumstances, through <clears throat> our uh, our United States Senator from Minnesota, his office helped get the fingerprints unstuck. It was just this long process, but God gave us an exodus. Finally, the day came when Dan and Dan were able, they were allowed out of the country. And what a wonderful thing that was. Now, it didn't mean that the, the end of trials were over, right? But, you know, it's just, Life is like that. You know, things seem to be going well and there's a challenge and then it's okay. And isn't life like that? It's, there's always some new challenge that we're going to face. But I just want you to know that God is at work in all of these things. And when God wants to show his activity, his <clears throat> love, his power, He'll often take an impossible situation and allow it to become even more impossible. But then he takes an insignificant person or people and he does something wonderful. Our hope is that God is still that same God, that even in the midst of the ups and downs and challenges of life, as we just went, looked at all those different people in the book of Genesis and what's going to happen now with Moses and with the others, uh, with all of his people, it's going to be that process, but he's always faithful in doing it. That's why the book of Exodus is so important. God is a God of exit, okay? That reminds me of 1 Corinthians 10, 13, where it talks about temptation. Sometimes we feel like when things get so hard, that like I can't take it anymore. I have to give in. Okay, that's not true. That is a lie of the enemy. You do not have to give in because 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, all the temptations that you face are common among people. But he says, God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But with every temptation, we will provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. God will provide a way out. He will provide an exit. God will provide an exodus for you so that you can stand up under temptation. You do not have to go Satan's way. You can go God's way and he will be there to help you. Okay. Every day there's going to be temptations and they can seem so strong, but look for, look for the way out that God provides because Satan loves to have us held captive held captive by Satan, by our own desires. But God wants us to be free. And God is in the process of bringing that about in our lives, even spiritually. Jesus is the exodus for us. He is our savior. He is our helper. That Holy Spirit is the comforter, our guide, the one who teaches us. Do not give up. Do not despair. The temptation that you have faced can be forgiven when you give in and it will be a victory for you. God's people were meant for victory, for freedom. And that I believe is true for you and for me. Let me just pray. Lord, we thank you that you are the God who does the impossible through unlikely people. And here we are, Lord, we are unlikely people. We are not strong. We are not famous by any means, and we are weak. Even, even the things that we've gone through this morning are an example of, of just how life can be a challenge. The things that people have gone through in these past few weeks, we think of Diane with cancer and people who have fallen and had fractures and other illnesses and job struggles and finances, cars, <laughs> uh, the list could go on, Lord. We are a people insignificant and we struggle 
but we believe that you care about us. You hear our voice and there is hope. Give us hope. Fill these dear people with your hope, Lord, that you are not done yet, even when it seems rough. Let us be steady through the ups and downs of life, knowing that you are with us and show us the way out of temptation. Show us that you are with us. Show us that you are at work and that you are going to help us. So to not give up or despair. Help us, O oh Lord, as we study and uh, live out the lessons that we learned from the book of Exodus in these coming weeks. In Jesus' name, amen.